Is Schwab Bank the next to fail? I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, bank runs have hit Schwab Bank, and we said this was going to happen because even as one of the nation's largest banks, and they're up there in about the top 10, that they were not immune to deposit flight, we're going to take a look at what's going on with Schwab and why some of the other big banks could be next. Plus, we're hearing out of the White House that there's no sign of recession coming later this year. But are they wrong? We'll take a look at that. And we're finding out that in New York, the manufacturing sector is rebounding. But are the storm clouds on the horizon? And what's driving interest rates higher? Does it have to do with the fact that the government is almost broke? Well, we'll take a look at that. Let's head over to our headline story today as we look at Bloomberg, which posts Schwab deposits tumble a whopping 30% as a brokerage pauses share repurchases. You remember last week we talked about how the CEO of Schwab was rather confident that everything was going to be okay, but when we started looking underneath the data, we find out that they've been borrowing tens of billions of dollars and they were likely going to be the subject of the next round of bank runs. And here we're seeing it that even as one of the biggest banks, they're not immune. Customer deposits dropped a whopping $325.7 billion as of the end of March, roughly in line with expectations, but they're still down 11% since the, since the end of last year. The firm cited regulatory uncertainty for its decision to pause stock buybacks following the collapse last month of three U.S. lenders, including Silicon Valley and Signature Banks. And, you know, it was notable that last week and in the comments, many of you said, hey, wait a minute, they shouldn't be borrowing money to buy their stock back. And sure enough, they were, but now the pressure's on them as deposits start to come crumbling down. Schwab has no choice but to stop borrowing money to buy stocks, buy their stock back. And this kind of makes perfect sense of what's happening to Schwab because it's going to eventually happen to other banks as depositors wake up and realize that, wait a minute, if I just move my money elsewhere, perhaps I can get a higher yield and maybe I'll feel just as comfortable at where I'm at now, or maybe I can diversify my holdings and that way I can still stay under the FDIC limits. And Schwab, they're saying our top priority this quarter was to stay connected to our clients to help them understand what is happening in the marketplaces from CEO Walt Bettinger. And what this is simply translated is we're reaching out to our customers and trying to tell them why they need to stay here and what we're up to. Because one of the problems with Schwab Bank, and then this ties back to their brokerage. Again, I don't want to confuse the two. This is the bank. We're not referring to Schwab Brokerage, which I know many of you trade through. And the difference being is one is where people trade the others where they have their money and the problem with the bank is they're paying very low deposit rates and of course that is subsidizing the brokerage side of their operations now it doesn't mean the broker side's at risk but the bank side could be at big risk and here's why because schwab is paying a whopping 0.48 percent on deposits as many of you have known and has said in the comments hey you can get better money elsewhere in fact on the schwab website it says hey if you move over to our purchase money funds or into a CD, which Schwab will now then start to direct clients over to, that you can keep your money here. The question is, what's the problem with Schwab? Well, it's the same problem as many of the other big banks are facing, is either they don't have to actually give higher rates out, or in the case of Schwab, they have such a large pool of unrealized losses on their investment portfolio that they bought at rather low yields. They can't offer higher yields, but again, the challenge for Schwab is their business model says, hey, we need the these low rates and we need a whole bunch of deposits behind them and then the question will become are the other big banks immune to this or will people flee looking for higher rates and here you can see looking at this top 10 list of banks here in the uh, top 15 we see schwab is listed around number eight and depending on the report you'll see them around number eight through to say perhaps number 10 or 11 or 12 and just the question becomes is is this just a matter of time before we see depositors wake up and start moving their money and this will put more stress on the banks and of course we know schwab now is going to be under full damage control because as people start to see these in the, their name in the news and start looking at the rate of return, well, they might leave putting more stress on the big bank. 
But yet customers continue to add money to their Schwab investment products. Again, I said this would happen. I said people would look elsewhere, maybe not just on the banking side, but shifting, shifting over to the broker side and then investing their money themselves. Sure enough, that's what we're seeing. And that doesn't help the banking side as core new net assets told 132 billion, including 53 billion in March alone, the second most ever for the month, as people look to the market, perhaps even in treasury securities that they feel safe safer with than the bank. Of course, this is all due to the Federal Reserve's rapid interest rate hikes, which encourage customers to move their funds away from Schwab's low-yielding accounts, which underpin its revenue in search of higher rate options elsewhere. This, my friends, is a story I don't think is going away anytime soon, and Schwab could just be the first round of the next wave of bank runs. But not to worry, the White House says everything's okay. White House rejects Fed staff outlook, says no sign of recession. Remember, the Fed minutes said we talked about how there would likely be a mild recession later this year. And it's extremely unusual. You almost never hear policymakers come out ahead of something and say, hey, we think bad things are coming. You, you may remember back to the global financial crisis, the former Fed chair, Janet Yellen, this was before she was a Fed chair, as her own market at San Francisco, the real estate market was crazy. She was on public record saying, hey, I don't see anything going wrong here. There's no housing crisis. And then there turned out to be, well, now we're seeing the White House in full damage control. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said numbers in consumer spending are strong and chalked it up to President Joe Biden's economic plans waving off a recession risk. We're, not, we're seeing the success of his plans and recent economic indicators are not consistent with a recession or even a pre-recession. But what do you think? Do you think his plans are working? Do you think the Biden economy is strong enough to sell the Fed? No way there's a recession. Or do you think we're heading into one and they're in denial? Well, I'll weigh my case on this as we continue. Jean-Pierre pointed to job gains, the unemployment rate, and consumer spending is indicators. She said that inflation has been falling, though it remains well above target, and may spur more hikes, raising the chance of recession. Still, she said, the Fed is wrong. Those are indicators that show us we are not headed to a recession or a pre-recession. And with that, of course, you know we've got a chart on this. Let's take a look and see, as they cite the unemployment rate as an issue that says there's no recession coming, well, perhaps, White House, you're wrong. Here you can see the unemployment rate in blue, and I've overlaid the 10-year, three-month yield curve. Of course, the baseline for the yield curve here is in black. So when you see that underneath that baseline, when it's inverted, you can almost predict that the unemployment rate is at or near a bottom. Here you can see this rail you know, going back uh, in the late 80s, we see it again right before the dot-com bubble. We see it again right before the global financial crisis. We see it again happening before the pandemic. Now, you have to remember, we were likely headed into a global recession. Now we see this extremely steep, the steepest we have on data here of the yield curve being inverted. And what is it telling us? It's telling us that the unemployment rate is at or near a bottom. As we'll go back to the chart in a moment here, you see what happens when it's at or near a bottom is fall by these gray shaded bars, which tell us a recession is on its way. So the question I'll ask you is, do you think the Biden economy is strong enough and that we're not going to have a recession? Do you think we're going to have one anyways? Or is that chart just telling us what the truth really is? The Empire Manufacturing Survey says, hey, things are pretty good. And all of a sudden, as business activity increased in New York State for the first time in five months, according to firms in their early April survey. Now, remember, this is in the first week of April. Notably, I want to point out the new orders and shipments surge. And what we saw is about 47% of firms said their new orders went up. Now, remember, it doesn't tell us the volume of them. It just says, compared to the last survey, that their new orders, 47% of firms said they had more orders than they had last time. Could be just one, but nevertheless, they had more orders. Let's dig deeper into this because one of the questions here is if there is actual real demand in the economy and these new orders matter, the labor market indicators, well, they're still weak. As a survey said, the number of employees remain negative for a third consecutive month, suggesting we may see further layoffs in the manufacturing sector. 
and the average work week in the index held below zero at minus 6.4 and indicating that employment and hours work shrank. Now, this is not something you would expect to hear when there's new order growth increasing. So the question is, why aren't firms responding to this increase in new orders with an increase in employment or perhaps an increase into hours work? Well, there's a simple reason why. Firms are not very optimistic as they look at future business conditions edged up 6.6, .6, suggesting the firms, now mind you, they don't expect activity to improve much over the next six months. So as new orders and shipments are expected to increase modestly and employment is expected to grow, the capital spending index rose three points and the technology spending index came in at 10.3. So what they're saying is here, hey, we're pretty well staffed up for what is coming. We don't think we have a real big need to respond to these new order increase just yet. But yet what we're seeing from the University of Michigan, we got this on Friday, is consumers seem a little bit more optimistic. The question then is why? And why are they seeing inflation expectations increase? And here we can see the preliminary results for April index of consumer sentiment up from 62 to 63.5, current economic conditions up 60, from 66.3 to 68.6, and overall consumer expectations up from 59.2 to 60.3. So broadly, we're seeing here, consumers are more optimistic. The question is why? Well, it's just because of the high correlation it has, at least the survey results, to the stock market. And here you can see University of Michigan consumer sentiment in blue. And mind you, this does not have the preliminary data. They do not report that out to the St. Louis Fed database against the Wilshire 5000 price index shown on a year over year rate of change. So again, as the stock market in red on a year over year rate of change looks to creep up higher, well, sentiment heads up with it. But what's driving inflation expectations, which also appear peaked up a little bit in the report, but not shown on their website on the headline there. What we can note is there's a strong relationship with gas prices, and we've seen gas prices head up here recently, suggesting that inflation expectations should also head higher. And is that what's really driving interest rates up? Well, perhaps it has to do with the fact that the government could be broke sooner than we think. Tax day cash will indicate just how close the U.S. is to default as the Treasury's cash balance is around levels last seen in 2021. And here we can see that they maintain our current base for mid-August X date, but we see risk skewed towards earlier, according to Bank of America. In their view, an increase in the Treasury cash pile of more than $200 billion following this week's tax day would be strong, while a figure of less than $150 billion would be weak. And watch out for investors demanding higher yields on securities that are due to be repaid shortly after the U.S. runs out of borrowing capacity. That's because the government won't be able to sell fresh securities and get cash to repay holders. In past episodes, that's created an unusual kink in the curve around the most vulnerable point. And right now, there are small dislocations around various maturities, but not one clear-cut spot. And a certainty over the Federal Reserve's interest rate policy path in the near term is also a complicating factor. But if a clear distortion does emerge, then it's a significant red flag. And this is not unusual. We tend to see when there's concerns of the debt ceiling not be raised. It's not unusual to see a response from the market. And it's generally rather transitory where we see the market push rates higher. And then next thing you know, they had a whole bunch lower after either there's some hope of it getting settled or just sentiment changes about what the government's actually going to do. Of course, the question is, do you think this is going to go down to the wire or do you, and the Republicans are going to get what they want? Or do you think the White House is going to reign supreme here and get them to agree sooner than later? And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.